Hi student, hope you are doing well. Today I'm going to start lecture 22 in this course and today we are going to discuss about airfoil cross sections and specifically about the aerodynamics of airfoil, specifically CL, CD, CM, their graphs and the mathematical models with respect to alpha which is the angle of attack which the airfoil section sees with respect to the flow. I'm Dr. Anjan Ganguly. Now, if we look at any airfoil section, we have already seen that the lift, drag, and pitching moment characteristics can be summarized through certain coefficients, which are the lift coefficient CL, the drag coefficient CD, and the moment coefficient CM. And these are essentially functions of alpha, where alpha is the angle which the airfoil cord line makes with respect to the air flow. So I am assuming the air flow is coming along this particular line here. So as you will expect that if alpha goes up, these values may change and so on. So how do we obtain this relationship? Now, one of the ways is of course to use experiments here. Experiments are always the truth figure as far as any physical system is concerned. So that's the way to go about it. So whenever we are thinking of any airfoil cross section, we are essentially assuming what is known as an infinite wing. So what happens in an actual wing is that there is some flow from below the wing to the top of the wing. And so this constitutes what is known as a three dimensional effect. Now, what happens in an airfoil section is that we are considering a two dimensional wing and therefore there is no such flow taking place. So what we do is that we make a wing such that it spans from one end of the wind tunnel to the second end. And this is a constant cord wing. So this is the front view of the wind tunnel and this is the typical side view. So essentially the air is going in here. We have the cross section somewhere in the middle and then toward the exit the air is again going out. I have just given these schematically. These velocities are of course going to be different governed by continuity equation and Bernoulli equation as we have discussed in some of our previous lectures. So when we do these tests, what do we obtain? So let's start with the lift coefficient for a typical cambered airfoil. And in that case, the CL versus alpha curve is like this. So I've given it by the blue line here. So there is a linear region till a point and then the CL value starts going down or the lift starts going down. So what we do is that we very often in our calculations consider only this linear region and this point where the lift starts going down is essentially related to stall and stall is related to flow separation. So this alpha stall value could be something like 12 to 15 degrees for many airfoil cross sections. Now the maximum value of lift here is known as CL max. And there is a value here alpha L equal to zero, which is actually the CL value being zero and the alpha corresponding to it. So this is going to happen whenever there is a cambered airfoil present because what happens in the cambered airfoil is that even if you put it at zero angle there is going to be some lift generated there and so you have to put it at a slightly negative angle here so that the lift essentially becomes zero which is this point here at this particular angle you can see that CL has reached the zero point. Now of course you can clearly see that the slope of this lift curve is DCL by D alpha. This is a very important parameter which often figures in various equations. So this is often known as the lift curve slope. Now, what would happen if we had a symmetric airfoil? If we had a symmetric airfoil, the curve would essentially pass through zero. So when alpha would be zero, CL would be zero. And there are many situations where symmetric airfoils are used. For example, as far as helicopter rotors are concerned, symmetric airfoils are quite ubiquitous. So let us now look at the physics at two different points in the flow. So first, let me start with this point I've shown in green here. 
this is a point in the linear unstalled region which is the nice looking region given by the straight line now this region corresponds to essentially attached flow around the airfoil cross section so you have a typical airfoil here you have the streamlines which are going smoothly around this airfoil cross section this is the typical flow we like to have and this is the flow at which often cruise takes place for most aircraft which are flying in passenger flight for example if you are traveling between any two cities in a passenger jet you are likely to be cruising at a very low angle such as five degrees or something like that and so the flow is going to be attached here in general now what about the situation here which i have shown in red and here you can see that the lift has started to fall so this is actually in the stalled region so after alpha stall essentially there is flow separation and so therefore the lift has started to decrease so in this case the airfoil is like this the angle is more you can see here it may be 17 degrees or something like that and in that case you can see that there is separated flow in the region which is near the trailing edge at the upper surface and so this is of course all related to the boundary layer getting separated and so on transition from laminar to turbulent and all those different phenomena which we discussed previously in the video related to flow separation so essentially keep in mind that most of the airplanes actually try to fly in this regime which is the linear regime because that's where you get nice characteristics as far as the airflow is concerned and you get a increase in cl with any increase in alpha now once you are in this region any increase in alpha is actually going to lead to a decrease in cl which is not necessarily good for the pilot in terms of controlling the aircraft and in terms of generating enough lift to keep the aircraft in air so now let's look at the different coefficients the drag and the moment so first let's look at the drag coefficient which is cd so cd is actually somewhat like this it's more or less constant and then it starts going up after stall at this point now this is not really constant but in many cases people do assume cd to be some constant value cd zero but actually there are some models which tell you it's kind of like a quadratic polynomial so we'll look at some of the math models later so again of course remember that drag is always positive because we are living in the real world there is friction there is viscosity and therefore cd value is always going to be a positive number cd is all is always going to be on this side of the graph now next is the moment coefficient cm and before we discuss the moment coefficient let us define the typical notation used as far as moments are concerned so if we have the airfoil section moment is positive clockwise so that's the direction i have shown here so now what happens is that if you have a cambered airfoil the moment is actually a small negative number and so it's somewhat like this and then after stall of course there is a sudden change or fall in the moment here there are large torsional loads which can actually be generated because of this fall in moment and which can be quite drastic but keep in mind that like i mentioned before most of the airplanes try to work in this region and so here the moment is somewhat of a constant though it changes to some extent now if you were a symmetric airfoil then your moment would be something like this so essentially it would be quite small or nearly zero and then it would start to come down after the stall take place so that's some thing which to keep in mind and this is one of the reason why in certain situations we actually use the symmetric airfoil because we don't want moment generations to take place because moment like i mentioned before can lead to torsional loads or twisting type of loads being generated on the wing section or on the rotor blade if you are in a helicopter so now let's turn to the math model of these phenomena and these are all in the region below the stall condition so essentially these are in the attached flow region 
So Cl can be expressed as C0 plus C1 alpha, where C0 and C1 are constants. And you can obtain these constants from any experimental data by essentially fitting in this kind of a straight line to it. Cd can be expressed in this form here, D0 plus T1 alpha plus T2 alpha square, and Cm is M0 plus M1 alpha. Now, these simple models are very often used in many situations. For example, if you are trying to derive certain expressions in terms of CL, CD, CM, at the end of those derivations, we often put in these equations here, and then we put in the values of alpha correspondingly. Now, do remember that in reality, things are more complex. Here we have assumed that the Reynolds number and the Mach number are essentially at certain fixed values, but in many cases, you may actually have to consider the fact that Mach number and all number are also changing and you can use a table lookup type of situation there where you have values of these different parameters and you can simply go to the curve or the table and get the corresponding values. So there are two options here. You can use table lookup or you can use polynomial fits on the data which you have obtained from any kind of internal experiments. Now, I find that most people prefer table lookups because it's very easy to do an interpolation and to find out the CL, CD, CM value corresponding to any particular alpha value. Now, let's look at the pressure distribution on the airfoil. So, again, contemplate this kind of airfoil section here. So, we had already defined CP in a previous lecture, and just to review it, CP is P minus P infinity by Q infinity, where Q infinity is the dynamic pressure, half rho infinity, V infinity square. Infinity refers to the free stream value, so it's the air coming from front. And, of course, rho is density, V is velocity of that free stream air, and P is the pressure on the surface of the airfoil. So, if we plot the pressure for the lower surface, we get this red line here. And if we plot the pressure for the upper surface, we get this blue line here. And on the top and the pressure which is coming from the upper surface, that's a suction pressure. So there is a negative value here of Cp minus 1 and here it's Cp1. Now, this particular graph tells you a lot about the pressure which is essentially generated by the airfoil and one of the reasons the airfoil selection is very important and often ubiquitous as far as uh, aerospace engineering is concerned is because airfoils give you very attractive pressure distribution as you can see there is a very good suction at the top and so you get very good lift to drag ratios and these are very attractive features for aerospace engineers now one more thing to remember is the prandtl clavert's rule. And prandtl clavert's rule essentially lets you modify the CP value to include the effect of compressibility or Mach number. So essentially, if we have some value which is obtained without considering Mach number, then we can modify CP using this formula that is CP0 root 1 minus m infinity square. Now, this is valid at the Mach number between 0.3 to 0.7. So, remember, below 0.3, you are essentially in incompressible flow. So, in this region, you can pretty well use the prandtl clavert rule for many calculation. Do remember that if you are more than 0.7, this rule again starts breaking down. Now, how would you calculate the lift coefficient from the CP value. So like I mentioned, if you were to do an experiment in the wind tunnel, you could use pressure sensors to get this kind of curve for CPU and CPL. And we can actually relate CL to CPL and CPU in this manner here. So essentially, as you can understand, it is the integral. So if we go from the front to the end of the airfoil, what we have to do is to integrate this and subtract this. So Essentially, what this integral is telling you mathematically is to find this cross section, which I have shown in these dash in these lines here. So, essentially, whatever is inside this particular CPL CPU curve is going to be CL. Now, this expression is actually derived from the fact that there is a normal force constituent from CP, and so that is the source of the lift. And it's valid for 
angles which are small. So fortunately, most planes fly at relatively small angles, such as alpha is less than five degree. This is where most airplanes cruise. And so therefore we can use this expression to immediately get CL for our particular problem. Now, just like I mentioned for CP, there is a fact about drag which we also need to keep in mind. And this is the fact that drag also varies with Mach number and the variation is given here. So CD is proportional to one by root of M infinity square minus one. Now you can of course plot this curve and check it out and you will start seeing that there is a singularity at m infinity equals one. So if I put m infinity equals one here, this is going to become zero. And so CD is going to become infinite. This is something which we can easily see from this equation. Now, one of the facts is of course that use of this equation is not actually valid at this m infinity equal to one region. But in the early days, as far as aerodynamics was concerned, people had not yet broken the sound barrier. And they used to find that actually the drag would go up as you go faster and faster. So in the transonic region, the drag was going up very substantially. So there was some concern that maybe the sound barrier cannot be broken, that it is kind of a physical barrier which exists because of the laws of physics. And so people had a lot of trepidation about this aspect. So people were to some extent afraid of this singularity and the thinking among many people was that maybe, you know, if you tried to do this kind of breaking the sound barrier, the aircraft would simply break up and unfortunately all the pilots and people would all die. So what actually happened is that you could simply break through the sound barrier by having more power. So you had to wait for the jet engines to come up and once jet engines come came up, people were also able to sweep the blade and then they could easily overcome the high drag which was present at this particular regime. So it was not that the singularity could not be crossed. The fact was that this equation itself was not valid at m equal to one. So these are things we need to keep in mind that very often the equations we have, math models we have may not be valid across all possible regimes. So today's lecture was certainly important because airfoils are the bread and butter of aircraft people. And we see that airfoil data can be obtained from wind tunnel tests, which is why wind tunnel tests have been so important. Fortunately for us, most of the standard airfoils have been tested very thoroughly. And there are books out there which give you a lot of information about the CL, CD, CM curves. And so you can refer to the data from these kind of textbooks. And we also see that these kind of airfoil data is very critical for various theories, which are generally known as blade element theories. And these theories essentially consider that you are using a certain piece of the blade in the case of helicopter rotors or wind turbine or of the wing in the case of airplanes, and then do various calculations for load prediction based on this airfoil characteristics at that location, CL, CD, and CM. We also saw that there is a large drag increase taking place at M equals one, and this is the sound barrier, but it can be crossed if you have more power. There's kind of some philosophy behind this also that many times when you face barriers in life, you can probably apply more power and more motivation and cross that barrier. And there's also the important concept of critical and drag divergence Mach number. So these are all related to this variation of CD with respect to the Mach number. We are going to discuss that in detail later. Compressibility effects start becoming more important because as you know, most of the useful aircraft nowadays fly pretty close to the speed of sound. And also some of them even fly faster than the speed of sound. And in fact, if you look at most of the jets out there which are flying today, for example, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, the Airbus A350, any of these aircraft, they fly at speeds which are only slightly below the speed of sound. So these are all transonic aircraft. And this is the reason why you can fly very long distances nowadays, for example, between Bangalore and San Francisco in one direct flight. 
So these things have become possible because of the advances in aerospace engineering. So just to summarize again, the simple math models which we discussed today, CL was C0 plus C1 alpha. C1 is the lift curve slope. CD is D0 plus D1 alpha plus D2 alpha square. CM is M0 plus M1 alpha. And always remember that CD must always be positive because of basic effects of friction and viscosity and so on. So I'll end this video now. I think I've reached the end. Yeah, this is the end of the lecture. And in the next class, we'll start discussing about finite wings. So we will say goodbye to airfoil sections and then start talking about the finite wings.